Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. 2 Timothy 4, verse 9. This passage was written about 30 years after the Apostle Paul began his ministry, about 30 years after Paul was converted, he wrote this. This is the end for Paul. These are the last paragraphs of Paul. You wonder, what was Paul thinking about in his final days? Uh, This is it. 30 years of gospel ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ and this. I can picture 30 years. I can think about 30 years. I started in August, uh, started at Spring Creek 30 years ago. So I come here and uh, I feel the drive all the way up, kind of feel like my head's going to explode. I said to Jamie, we got off on 164 and started to drive up and I said to Jamie, poof, there goes 30 years. And so many beautiful people here. Amazing how many beautiful people from that time still here. Uh, Really, Really something, in fact, you know, pastors were paranoid about getting into church on Sunday morning. So I said to Chip last night, what time will the building be open? And Chip said, Bob will open the building. He gave me the time. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. He was opening the building 30 years ago. So, and, and listen, that, and Chip goes, well, it started long before that. Well, I, I only go back 30 years, but is that so beautiful? I'm telling you, I'm trying to get people to do stuff for a couple months in a row, and, and 30 years, and then I see Danny Noldy before the service, and I'm thinking about one of the last youth, youth events I led at Spring Creek Church at Camp Fairwood. The pastor came up, and gave me a hard time because our kids raided their cabin in the night. And I like got back in his face and I said, hey, I slept by the door. And our kids did not raid your cabin. We're on our way to breakfast and I said to Danny, you guys, you didn't raid a cabin last night. And his response was, oh, that was so great. (laughs) That was was so great. And so that's when I knew Maybe I've been in youth work too long, but then Casey does it forever. Um, But listen, there are many historic churches. There really are many historic churches in the world. There are very few historic churches that are still doing vibrant Christian ministry. And that is a testimony to the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ on this flock. I'm so thankful for the faithful example of your leaders, of Tom Price, who was here when I came 30 years ago and has been such a blessing to this church, of Chip's example in faithfulness. Thankful for the history of this church. I've always been a historian. I used to quiz Delamay. Some of you remember Delamay. I used to quiz Delamay about a ministry, and she would tell me stories uh, way back from downtown days, and to see you're still here vibrantly going forward. I could, someday I'm going to come back, and I'll just make stories up, but, but we're here to focus on the Word of God, so 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, picture it, picture it, this is Paul at the end, lonely, cold, hurting, knows his time is up. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. 
Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to, su to support my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from e every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I know that uh, sitting here right now, there are doubtless people who have been deeply and grievously hurt. Where they, uh, their minds run, run round and round about what has happened. And they long to be uh, free of it. They long to have peace. We're so thankful that you have graciously spoken in your word. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would now illuminate it, bring it to bear powerfully on our lives for your glory and our joy, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. When I wrote Unpacking Forgiveness, if you've seen a copy of the cover, there's a suitcase on it. It was a metaphor, of course. It's this idea that we all have baggage, we all have luggage, we all have things that we need to unpack. And you come home and you start to put things in their place. But it's been out for a number of years now and I realize it's not quite the right picture. Uh, unpacking forgiveness, working through those kinds of issues isn't something uh, we do in an evening. It's more like moving houses. Most of us have moved houses at one time or another, and we know that there is a day that we move, the trucks come, we start to unpack, and we say, we moved, we unpacked. But we know that that process continues on for a very, very long time. You move on a particular day, but then two years later, you're down in the basement, uh, moving stuff around underneath the ping pong table, and you find this box of junk that you've got to deal with. That's how it is with forgiveness, isn't it? Uh, you have things that you worked on 20 years ago, and you think you've dealt with it, and you're still unpacking it. And the goal of unpacking forgiveness is to help people understand uh, how Christ might help them through that. Jamie and I were in Northern Ireland this summer. You don't know the kind of audience that a book might get when you write it, but the book was uh, received well in Northern Ireland where there are many uh, victims of the troubles. And if you remember your history, you know what they call the Troubles in Northern Ireland was a period focused from 1968 to 1998 where there were all kinds of political slash religious violence. Thousands, thousands of people died. There would be some parallels on a smaller scale to what's happened in Israel in the past couple of months and, and recent decades and what happened in Northern Ireland. People, people just murdered. So they invited me to come and speak about the subject of Christian forgiveness. One of the things they did was they said, we wanna give you a tour of where some of the violence took place. So I went, I, I pictured this would be kind of in a gritty area of Belfast. 
I, I know where the wall is there and where a lot of demonstrations have taken place. And I thought that's where we, we would be going, but we went to a rural area. It looked like Southwest Wisconsin. You can picture Southwest Wisconsin, many of you, like the, the spring green, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright area in, in Southwest Wisconsin. Beautiful rolling hills, looks idyllic, looks pastoral. Uh, you wouldn't expect that tremendous violence had happened there. But four of us got in a car, because it's Europe, they drive cars the size of a Pepsi can, right? We're all like packed in here closely together. And uh, me and another guy in the front seat, two guys in the back seat, guy in the back seat's doing the talking. We drove in this little village, we drove down the street and our first stop was a school bus stop. And we stopped at that site because it was where a school bus with children on it had been blown up. I couldn't believe it. Some of the people there had, had been around for that, tried to do triage. Jamie hadn't been feeling that well, well that day. She didn't come with us. And I thought how glad I was that she hadn't you know, been there. She'd hear that through the lens of being a grandma and just be too much. And, you know, I had gone into this trying to understand sort of a two-sided moral argument, but when you get to blowing up uh, school buses, it's not hard to find moral clarity there. So I was reeling, I mean, emotional, reeling. One of the ladies, students, third grader, who'd been saved, gone on to be uh, a leader. I was thinking about all of this. We went about a quarter of a mile down the road and pulled over, and the guy in the back said to the guy driving, Noel, why don't you tell Chris uh, why we stopped here? And the guy driving about my age just kind of looks out the window, didn't say anything, just kind of silence. And then he sighed and he said, well, this is where I lost, in his Irish accent, this is where I lost my leg. I didn't realize he had a prosthetic when we got in the car. I didn't realize that he had lost his leg. He said, you know, I always check my car for bombs, and he said, wouldn't you know it, the one time I didn't check. And he talked about, just all he saw was light and couldn't hear anything, and trying to get up, obviously couldn't get up. And he talked about what it was like to live in the community where the people who did this were still there. In Ireland, if, if you get really drunk, uh, an expression uh, that they sometimes say is that the person is legless. So the provisional IRA spray painted on the wall of a pub near where he was. If you want to get legless, go to this pub. And he had to look at that. Learn to walk with the prosthetic. Now, don't forget why I was there. I'm supposed to talk to him about forgiveness. What, what do I say to him? It's a good question. I'll give you a better question. Uh, what would I say to you? Uh, you, you know, his, his arm, he said, you know, my arm was badly, badly mangled. And he said, my arm continued to itch and have infection for years. And finally, they went back in 20 some years later and did surgery and there were still, and they took metal out of my arm that had been embedded 
for over 20 years. He said it was still, my car was blue, and he said the metal when they took it out was still the color of my car. They gave it to me after surgery. We can relate, if not literally, figuratively, because we have stuff embedded in our souls for a long time in our hearts, and it continues to hurt and cause us problems. What do I say to you? What would I say to him? What would I say to you? By the way, what I said to him at the time was, I put my hand on his shoulder and didn't say anything. What would I say uh, in time to him? Here's a better question, though. What does God's word say? How do you process people pain? How do you work through personal people pain? How do you find your way through it? Now, that's exactly what Paul is doing here. First of all, just notice how personal this section of Scripture is. Notice how many times Paul is using the first person singular pronoun, do a little word study, inductive Bible study, look down on the page at the Scripture. Paul says, come to me, Timothy. He told Timothy before, hey, stay at Ephesus. Or he told uh, Titus, stay in Crete. Now he says to Timothy, Timothy, come to me quickly, to me. Why? Because Demas has deserted me. He quit. He's gone. He's left the faith. Luke's with me. Get Mark. There's all kinds of pain wrapped up in there. I won't take the time to talk about Paul and Barnabas splitting, parting ways over John Mark, and all that happened. There's all kinds of uh, painful memories wrapped up. Healing, yes, but pain also. Bring him to me, because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I need my Bible, my scrolls. And then verse 14, 2 Timothy 4, verse 14. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. We don't know for sure the precise nature of the pain of the pain he inflicted. It's probable that Alexander was the reason that Paul was arrested and given a death sentence, and historical sources would tell us was then executed. That's a great deal of harm. So I'm gonna die. Alexander did me great harm. Verse 16, you wanna talk about pain? Look at verse 16. At my first defense, so Paul, who'd shared the Lord Jesus Christ from one side of the Roman Empire to the other, been stoned and beaten all over the uh, ancient Near East for the cause of Christ. At my first offense, who was there for me? Nobody, nobody. What did they do? Everyone deserted, strong word, same word used by Jesus on the cross. Everyone deserted me. And it goes on from there. This is personal and it is painful. Now, think of this in categories or buckets for a moment. Think about your own life. Could you put someone in each of those categories where your own life is concerned? People who quit, left the faith, and so the thing now, I, I remember one time I was speaking at a national conference on forgiveness. And I and another guy, keynote speakers, and he went out, uh, I'll never forget his opening line. I thought, he's so much more gifted, so much smarter than I am, so much better uh, preacher than I am. Where is he now? Quit. Completely, totally. We've got a word for this now. I didn't have this word used in this way when I was at Spring Creek. The word is deconstructed. I thought deconstructed was what, you know, we did with our kids' Legos when they were done. We put them back 
Now, now we're telling no. People, there are people who take their faith apart like a Lego set and renounce it. Boy, does that hurt. And then there's just people you miss. They didn't quit. Um, God, in his providence, took Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. We get that. But we sure do miss them. Think of people you really miss. Wait, a lot of people from this church I miss. Uh, a lot. Chip, Tom, pastor, staff here, we've done a lot of funerals. You just love to have a cup of coffee with some of these people. Just nothing fancy, wouldn't it be great? just to visit, people who quit, people you miss, and then just evil people. Alexander, he did me great harm. I've spoken on forgiveness so many times. I know I'm looking at the faces of people, not all of you, but many of you who have dealt with evil. And, and you, you know that pain. And then Christians who, for whatever reason, let us down. At my first defense, no one came to my support. And then he just repeats it. You know, you know how much you're thinking about it. At my first defense, no one came to support or stand by me Everyone deserted me. How do you find your way forward when you're tossing and turning about the things that have been done to you? Well, here's the here's big idea. Here's the principle. Here's the central thought. Here's how you do it. Look up, not in. Look up, not in. That, that's what Paul says. I'm looking to God not to myself. My focus isn't on myself. My focus isn't on the people. My focus is on the Lord and what he's going to do. Look up, not in. Look at the cross. Got a cross back here. Look at the cross, not in the mirror. You just look at yourself. I have a hard time dealing with this. Binge on the Bible, not on the sands of your own time, that you, of your own life that you're sifting through over and over again. Now, notice how Paul says he looks to God. He says, first of all, the Lord will repay Alexander I don't have to get him back. What is Alexander getting away with? Nothing, zero, zip. No legal maneuvering, no high-priced lawyers, no biased juries. In one second, in one flash, he will stand before God who knows all and sees all, and the Lord will repay him according to what he did. What will God do? God will stand at my side. If you are here, now think about this. Stop and think about this. If you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be sure of this. People may let you down. He will stand by your side. I, I have to tell the story. I didn't tell this in the first service, but this being in this church brings back so many memories. I was a young pastor, brand new pastor, and didn't know beans from Buckshot about how to do uh, pastoral visitation or go to the hospital or deal with tough things. And Pastor Chip, Chip and I uh, went to the hospital. One of the uh, 
dear, dear couples of our church. He, he had had diabetes. He had a stroke that had to amputate his leg, and, and so it was just the end. It was the end. Uh, Mr. Kamak, the Kamaks. Some of you, some of you remember the Kamaks. And, and I had never been in this circumstance before, and Mrs. Kamak, a few of you would remember her. Uh, she's about this tall, right? She's, she's about that tall. And uh, her husband, this is the end. And uh, she just went and held his hand and stood there. It was a beautiful, beautiful picture. That, that's such a privilege as pastor to be invited into people's lives in such moments, and then such a, a privilege to uh, see someone standing by her husband's side, sort of between when the doctors were doing stuff, she lectured Chip and me, okay, <laughs> but, 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 but there she was standing there. But, but think now, think, Paul says, how am I going to get through this? the Lord will stand by my side. Not only that, but he will rescue me. He will rescue me. He says, um, he will deliver me, bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. This is where our confidence is. It's not in ourselves. It's not in figuring it all out. It's not in understanding it. You can't do that. It's not in some technique that we can take care of ourselves. It, his focus is on what God will do. God will judge. God will judge. You say, well, this is the critique uh, you might give to me of the sermon so far. It's how do we process people pain? The answer is we look up, not in. We look to God, not to ourselves. That's what Paul did. And your critique at this point might be, obviously, obvi. Didn't have to miss the first part of the Acker game to hear that, right? Okay, listen, I'll tell you, it's a lot of things in Christendom today. It's not obvious that this is the strategy. Most advice given in the name of Christianity right now, this is my area, I read the stuff that comes out, most advice shies away from this strongly. Most people are very authors, speakers, very reluctant in this context to talk about the judgment of God. Back to my trip in Northern Ireland, where we could talk about uh, Ethiopia, civil war going on, unpacking forgiveness being translated there now. But back to Northern Ireland, before that day was over, same day, I ended up seating in a room with a small group of people. And two people down from me on the right, two chairs over, was the guy who was driving the bus that was bombed, and his son, who didn't find the bomb on the bus, couldn't get beyond it and took his own life. Next to me was a man whose father had been murdered by the IRA in his workplace, in his office. The tell-all book uh, written by a former IRA member was called Killing Rage. And chapter one of the book is The Killing of Ivan Toombs. That's the title of the first chapter. The guy next to me, Paul Toombs, it was his father. Can you imagine opening up a book and reading chapter one, How We Murdered Your Father? He gave me a copy of the book. He, he said again in his Irish accent, I'll not buy a new copy, but I found a used one. You know, on this side of me was a lady named Jennifer. Six family members had been murdered. 
including her father, the home at their farmhouse. She was around back, just her and her dad home. She heard shots and she came out and found her dad. In addition, five other family members. Next person over, uh, three brothers in separate incidents had been murdered. Lady, her name, name is Pam. She's talking about her brother, Bobby. And the guy over here, the guy who lost his leg, said, oh, I was in a part of Bobby's funeral. And the, the Irish, they repeat everything. I was in Bobby's funeral, so I was. She goes, oh, I didn't know. Now, then I'm out with a pastor whose father and uncle had both been murdered. Now, here's a, here's a question. What do you say? What does God's word say to that? And I'm going to give you a line here, and I'm not trying to be cute or flippant or uh, provocative. This is just the truth. Here's, here's what you say to those people. Hell will be hot enough. Hell will be hot enough. They say, well, that seems a little over the top. Well, you're sensible people. Look at the text for yourselves. What's Paul talking about when he says, the Lord will repay him for what he has done? What's he talking about in Romans 12 when he quotes Deuteronomy 32 and says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You say, well, that's, that's not quite so explicit. Well, flip back a few pages to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. More victims. How does Paul comfort them? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. What, do, what, does, what does Paul say? Verse 6, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled as, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Hamas is getting away with nothing. The Lord is coming soon. And he will repay back in blazing fire with his powerful angels, uh, those who have done, who are doing this. And one author objects. He says, well, that, that isn't loving, that isn't compassionate to say that. But, but paradoxically, it is fundamental, foundational to love. How could you ever feel compassion for people who did these kinds of atrocities? Answer, when you know that they will face a just judge and that they will, if they do not put their faith and trust in Jesus, uh, spend eternity uh, under judgment. That's what moves us to compassion. It, it, it's interesting, our softness from our pulpits in talking about hell makes hard, bitter people. A soft view of the justice of God is when people become hardened and calloused. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the World War II pastor who was executed by the Nazis, his friend Bernard Bethge asked him when he was in prison, like Paul, waiting to die, how can you feel compassion for the Third Reich? And Bonhoeffer said, it's only when the grim reality of the justice of God is hanging over your enemies that you feel compassion for them. But I know, I'm paraphrasing now, said Bonhoeffer, what they will face and so I'm moved by love. See, 
Christianity treats too many Christian voices who say they're Christian right now, you'll forgive the word picture, but they, they, they treat forgiveness like a kind of emotional laxative. They say, just let it go, get over it, move on. It's a private therapeutic technique you do for yourself. Now, here's what you do with it. Just give it to God, trust God with it. That's what Paul did. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. He, he wasn't defined by it. He wasn't bitter about it. See, the second teaching that's popular in our culture today is this idea that the way we find oursel our ways th ourselves through a personal people pain is we sift through all our memories, we process all our memories, and we work our way through them. One author says, uh, counsels, most popular book on forgiveness in the last five years. She says, collect the dots, connect the dots, correct the dots. Look through your life in a very fine way, analyze all the dots. I don't know most of you personally, I know this, you got a whole lot of dots. You, if you do that, you will be defined by a mental rehearsal of everything done to you. She goes on to say, there's an amazing person I want to make sure you don't miss meeting. And she's a sister in Christ, she's a believer. She's written a bestseller, so we need to dialogue with it. She says, there's an amazing person that I want to make sure you don't miss meeting. We would hope that would be Jesus. But she says, the one and only glorious you that you look at each day in the mirror. Every day, say to yourself, hello, beautiful, beautiful you. She says, I promise there's a healed, this is the quote, there is a healed version of me that is waiting and wanting to emerge. Now, people created in the image of God are beautiful. You all are beautiful. This little guy right down here in the champion gear, despite having a Kentucky cap, is, is beautiful, and I gotta tell you, he's a beautiful example in worship. I, I was sitting right over here, I'm looking at the worship team, but I'm listening to you. I'm watching his example. That's beautiful. Image bearers are beautiful, but listen, we're broken sinners too. If you think that you have the assets within yourself, that there's a healed version of you just waiting to emerge. If you look in the mirror every day and say, hello, beautiful, beautiful you, listen, you got a lot better mirror than I do. Um, and that's not what it looks like at my house in the morning. It's certainly not what it looks like uh, when I look in the mirror of the word. And that leads us to the next big move. I've preached this whole sermon like we're victims. And, and many of us are, and I'm not, I'm not downplaying that. But let's go back to those categories. Quitting, doing harm, being separated from people, deserting people in their time of need, how many of those categories do we fill? One way or another, all of them, myself included. You say, well, I'm not, you know, I haven't deconstructed. Okay, right. But all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. Now, here's a really important moment in the sermon, especially if you've been really, really hurt. Talk with someone after the first service. 
really, really hurt. Here's a really important moment. And it wasn't your fault. Here's where you're in danger. When we've been really hurt, we're in danger of being defined by thinking all the time about what is done to us and not dealing with our own stuff. We read a passage that warns about the fiery judgment of God and we think in terms of what might happen to the person who hurt us. Listen, we gotta do business ourselves. We have to deal with this ourselves. I am so thankful for this church that stands for the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you can turn and you must, you must, if you have not done this, you must repent, turn from your sin, put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow him. That's how it begins. Come to me all you are weary and burdened, says Jesus, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me I'm gentle and humble and hard. Don't say, hello, beautiful, beautiful me. Hello, beautiful, beautiful Savior. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Now, let me get really practical. So we we have a principle. How did Paul process personal people pain? He looked up, not in. He looked at the cross, not in the mirror. He looked at the Bible, more than he sifted through the dots of his experiences. So that's a, that's a principle. You say, tell me very particularly, what is my action item? You're like, yeah, hey, I'd love at two in the morning when I wake up thinking about this, I would love to be defined by God and not by me, but I can't make any headway. Practically speaking, what do I do? I'll give you, I'll give you two action items. Number one, Be part of a life group. Be part of a life group. Listen, you must be part of a life group. I have the advantage of not knowing your behavior problems or your behavior patterns. I don't know your problems. I don't know your patterns. I don't know who of you are arm's length from Christian community. But you can't process personal people pain coming in, treating the sermon like a commodity, going out. You need to be involved in community, involved with other people. This church has facilities like very few, very few. I'm righteously jealous. I'd love to have it. Why do you have it? Why do you have it? So you can connect and you can walk in and be, work through life's experiences with other believers. You need that, you must have it. Sometimes people say, what's my first action item? And I say, don't read my book. And they say, you know, my spouse left me, I'm a victim of abuse, and what should I do? And I say, don't read my book, and they think I'm, being silly, I'm like, well, I'm half serious. If right now, as a victim, you read Unpacking Forgiveness, I hope you all will. It's an excellent Christmas present, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Right now, but no, no, I hear this part though. If right now you read Unpacking Forgiveness, every page you flip, you will be thinking about what's done for you. Maybe that's not what you meet, need. You know what you need? And I'm, I'm, I'm being serious about this. Sign up for the nursery. Just, just go in, sit down, visit with people about life. Ask them how their week was. Ask them what stood out to them about the sermon. Ask them how you can pray for them. And over time, you take Jesus' yoke upon you and you learn from him and you will find rest for your soul. Be in a life group. Be in a life group. Number two, memorize scripture. Memorize scripture. You say, obvi. Well, if it's obvious, how well are you doing it? 
Why have you had Awana for how many years? 67 years or something like that? I made 64. I made a mistake one time of saying from the pulpit at this church, we're the 132nd Awana chapter. And everybody, like afterwards, I had all kinds of people in my face. They started at 100, pastor. We're the 32nd. So why, why, did, why, why did they, why do you do it? Be, because God's word revives the soul, makes wise the simple, gives joy to the heart, gives light to the eyes. It's more precious than gold, sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Just listen, memorize the Beatitudes and say them, you don't have to say them forever, just say them 500 times, okay? That's not so hard. How many times in the last week have you checked your phone? 500 times over the next year. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. You're like, what do you get for that? Answer, earth. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why did you show up and teach Sunday school today? Because you're hungry for righteousness. What happens? You'll be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. They shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Memorize it, say it 500 times. Every day, just put it on a three by five card. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I was a young pastor here. I was in a tough situation possibly, just maybe, a little more combative than I should have been, okay? I'm just saying. I was talking uh, to Chip about it, and he just looked at me, this is at the other building, and he just looked at me and said, blessed are the peacemakers. And I thought, oh yeah. I've been thinking about it ever since. You do that. Meditate on that for the next 30 years. Be defined by God, not by yourself. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look up, not in. Process people pain with the cross, not with the mirror. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word that's more precious than gold. I pray that some here would take action to not continue soaking and sifting in the dots of their lives, but looking more to you and your word. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.